Starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Um, welcome. I'd like to call to order the regular meeting of the Parks and Rec Recreation Commission for Wednesday, October 28th. Um, may we please have a uh, roll call? Uh, Commissioner Lee? 
Chair Clark? Here. Vice Chair McGill? Here. Commissioner Baker? Here. Commissioner Lesnar Buxton? Here. Commissioner Longstreet? Here. Commissioner Martinez Cohen? Here. Commissioner Perry? Present. Thank you. Um, I, do we have any changes to the agenda? Chair Clark, commissioners, no, no changes to the agenda. Okay, thank you. And do we have any written communications? No, we do not. Okay, thanks. Um, that brings us to public comment. Um, I believe Ms. Navarez, you give some instruction on how people can participate in public comment. Yes, Chair Clark, for those who wish to speak during the public comment, please use the raise your hand functionality in the GoToWebinar control panel. We are showing an icon, a slide now to show you how to do that. Okay, do we have any, can you see whether or not we have anybody here to, to speak on an item not on the agenda? I do not see any raised hands. Okay, thank you. And that brings us to our youth council report. And I believe we do we do have a youth council member present. I believe I saw him in the beginning. Chair uh, Clark, I'm here. Welcome. Do you have anything to report? I do. Uh, one, the youth council currently has nine members. Uh, and four new applicants are coming this year, including one junior high rep, which who won't be able to vote, but will still share their opinion, will be heard. Youth Council is working on several projects and special events at the moment. Youth, the Youth Council is working in collaboration with Santa Barbara Powell Program on the Trunk or Treat event that is taking place this Friday from 5 to 8 p.m. at the Spencer Adams parking lot located between 1235 Teen Center and the Davis Center. Pre-registration is required and can be done by calling staff at the 1235 Teen Center. In November, two of our youth council members, Julia Minor and Layla Goodman, will be attending the National League of Cities City Summit. This year's City Summit is being held November 18th through 20th and will be entirely online. Both Julia and Layla are this year's youth delegate planning, sorry, are on this year's Youth Delegate Planning Committee and have been working very hard to plan out for the youth portion of the City Summit. Thank you. Well, thank you. Thank you for your report. And uh, thanks to all of you on the Youth Council for continuing to be engaged and involved in this community, uh, despite the challenges presented by our current COVID climate. Um, we appreciate that. Chair Clark and Commissioners, I would also just like to acknowledge the Youth Council for, for adopting the GoToWebinar format and charging ahead with meetings and their plans for the year. So it's really great to see them be successful in that way too. Yeah, it is wonderful. Thanks again. Um, that brings us to our Commissioner Committee Assignment Reports. I'll start with um, Vice Chair McGill. Thank you. Um, the uh, Park Foundation did not meet this month. Thank you. Um, Commissioner Longstreet? Um, I attended the sea level rise um, adaptation plan meeting and the, the committee is going through all the public comment and commission comments they have received in making um, recommendations on changes to the draft so that it can go to its final format. Great, so we'll be you. meeting over the next couple of months and it is, um, the information is online at the city site. Thank you, Commissioner Longstreet. Um, Commissioner Martinez-Cohen. Um, yeah, unfortunately I was unable to attend the Creeks um, Commission meeting last week, um, but they did receive um, a presentation for action on the 
proposed capital improvement program every year. They look at a five-year budget for that. So they were looking at the 2022 to 2027 proposed uh, capital improvement plan and making uh, recommendations for the FY 22 to 23 budget uh, for the financial plan. So there'll probably be a presentation coming to our commission from that committee um, at some point in the near future about that. And so we'll have more details there and there are there is more information on the presentation and the minutes on the city website for that information. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, Commissioner Baker, I imagine you've been pretty busy with your new baby, but do you have anything yeah, to report? I, I, was, I was unable to attend the golf advisory committee um, because of the baby. <laughs> but okay, thank you. I've noticed I've driven by the golf course and it's looking great. Um, so I always just encourage everyone to get out there and it's a fun activity and they're taking really good care of it. So get out and golf. All right. Thank you. Uh, Commissioner Perry. Uh, Corey, you look like fatherhood is treating you well. You look thin. Um, arts and crafts are lots of correspondence lots of traffic going on and they are back in business so that is the best news so far through this pandemic we have an arts and crafts show on sundays thank you uh commissioner lexner buxton yes i attended the youth town show meeting and they're doing some projects in including a youth survey on the future of state state. Thank you. And that concludes our commissioner committee assignment. Oh, that's, I forgot about me. Um, I wasn't able to attend the STAC meeting, the Street Tree Advisory Committee meeting, but I did watch the um, video, recorded video of the meeting, and we will be discussing items on that agenda later. Um, Mr. Slack did report that there was one new enforcement case, uh, 20 total enforcement cases out there and three have been closed since they last met. Um, and with that, we'll move on to um, employee recognition. And Ms. Zachary, do we have any employees to recognize this month? Hmm. Chair Clark and Commissioners, yes, we do have one staff member that received a service award pin in the month of October, and that is Araceli Hernandez. Araceli received her five-year pin, and she works as an administrative specialist in the recreation division. She supports both the sports programs and sports section, as well as youth um, and um, has been integral to our response to COVID and putting camp together and getting everybody underway. So um, we're happy to have her on board. Yeah, congratulations to R.S. Elliott. I'm sure that was not an easy job the last couple of months. Um, thank you. Uh, next on our agenda is a summary of council actions. Did anybody have any questions about those? No questions. No questions. Okay. Um, I'd like to thank the council for upholding our decision to deny, deny the removal of this uh, removal of the street tree on Castillo Street. Uh, we appreciate we appreciate that greatly. Um, and now the minutes. We've all had a chance to look at it and read them. Would anyone like to make a motion? Motion to approve. I'll second that. Is there any discussion? Really hard. I can't see you guys. Okay. Um, all in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? All of okay, so since he wasn't there. Was that Commissioner Baker? Yes. Okay. Thank you. Okay. So moved. With that, I'd like to welcome Mr. Slack and uh, let's talk about our Street Tree Advisory Committee items. Oh, you're moving again. Yay. <laughs> <laughs> So Chair Clark and Commissioners, we have Brett Volpe, who's our Street Tree Supervisor, who will be doing the presentation of the Street Tree Advisory Committee recommendations today. Welcome, Mr. Volpe. Thank you. Um, uh, Chair Clark and Commissioners, the first item on our agenda is the Street Tree Advisory Committee 
uh, recommendation for review is located at um, 116 Santa Cruz Boulevard. And the setback tr three trees there um, is a pepper tree, a Chinese elm, and a weeping fig that are located around the corner property. Um, the application requested the removal of all three trees. Um, in terms of the weeping fig, its location being uh, close to the house, uh, listed as um, foundational damage uh, from the roots, um, also proximity and size uh, uh, being an issue. The second tree, the Chinese elm, is located between two driveways. Um, one branch does have leaned toward the house and overall the condition of the tree was listed as fair to poor. The third tree was a pepper tree and uh, listed as branches close to the house with uh, a head that leans out over the, the uh, yard there. Um, as the stack committee met on the matter and discussed it, um, it was uh, discussed at length that the, the uh, weeping fig tree uh, is too big in scope for the, for the front yard um, and that the tree is, is only to get bigger and that mitigations would be difficult. And um, in terms of the Chinese elm, they were looking at it. Um, there is a site of an anthracnose canker um, which is not totally detrimental to that species, but certainly um, is a factor. And again, just the position of the tree is, as uh, alongside the uh, overall decline was noted by the committee. Um, and in terms of the pepper, the, the stack committee didn't see a lot of um, reason for removal, rather saw um, pruning as a mitigation um, being quite straightforward. So um, the stack committee did put forward to remove the weeping fig and the Chinese elm with the contingency for two replacements of 25 foot um, height trees and um, denied the California pepper um, stating that it would be easy to mitigate with pruning. Um, so after review, the committee um, made the determination that the commission could make the findings that the principles of good forest management will be best served um, by the proposed removals and that the character of the immediate neighborhood with respect to forestation will not be materially affected by the proposed removals. Thank you, Mr. Volpe. Do we have any questions for him? No. No, okay. Um, Ms. Navarez, do we have anybody from the public here to speak on this particular agenda item? Um, yes, we have one person, but I'm sorry, we have to do a little switch here, so it's gonna take me a second. Okay. Uh, Mr. Raymond Ox would like to speak. Mr. Ox, if you could, un sorry, if you could unmute yourself, you will have two minutes to speak. Can you, okay. can you there we go. All right, you have two minutes. Uh, okay, uh, as far as the trees, the weeping fig, uh, like I said, it's raised the corner of the house. It's uh, destroyed the, uh, foundation inside in our living room, and it's only going to get bigger in those type of trees. The roots get a lot bigger, and it's uh, basically about a foot from the house right now. The Chinese elm, uh, it's been cut severely uh, prior to us owning the house. We just purchased the house. It's been cut severely on our side, and there's uh, wires uh, throughout the limbs as it's hanging over towards the other house. So that's why we would like that uh, cut also. They, the 
Uh, other tree, the pepper tree, I know we uh, need to trim it. If there's a, some type of recommendation on, on how much we can trim or how little we can trim, we'd like to hear that. But otherwise than that, we can, uh, we can live with trimming it back and taking the others out. We were looking at um, water gums or something of that similar or another palm tree to stick in the place of the two that we're taking out. Um, and it'd be in the front yard area because there's not room between the driveways to really put a tree. Uh, the best room that we have is in the front part of the yard. But that's pretty well all I got. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for taking the time to come talk to us. Um, do we do we have any questions from the speaker or uh, comments in general? Um, Rose, the switch you just made, whenever you do that, then people move for me. And then when you switch it back like you just did, they don't. Just just saying. Okay. I think it may have to do when the PowerPoint is up or something. Oh, yeah, I guess so. When PowerPoint's up, I don't see it. Okay, so do we have any? Um, I don't have any comments. I would make a motion to concur with the Street Tree Advisory Committee recommendation uh, to approve, partially approve the removal of the ficus and the Chinese elm on the condition that the applicant replace with two broadleaf green ever, two broadleaf evergreen trees that can achieve 25 feet in height and deny the removal of the pepper tree uh, based on the- Second that. Yeah. But the only thing I flag I mean, if the um, applicant is still on the line that him, they were talking about a palm tree replacement and this what we are about to approve stipulates broadleaf evergreen trees. I believe uh -huh. Commissioner Martinez Cohen made in the motion made that. Um, I, uh, I tried to I kind of stumbled over it, but yes. <laughs> uh, Chair Clark, did you want to hear from the from the homeowner again? He has his hand raised. If you, I don't know if you wanted to ask him a question or if we are we just continuing. Um, I um, I feel like he's responding to what uh, Commissioner Vice Chair McGill just said. So yes. I'd I'd like okay. to give him a chance to uh, briefly respond. Okay. All right, Mr. Ox, go ahead. Okay, so you're saying a broadleaf is like a, an evergreen that stays green during the during the winter months up 25 to 30 feet high. That's what, so uh, Canary Island date palm type tree wouldn't work. Um, I, I, I think, understand. Um, I believe, no, that, that wouldn't work, but that's something that you can um, bring your desired species to the city, the city okay. after. Uh, this and okay. they'll help you work through it. Okay, sure. that's fine. Whatever you want, I'll, I'll, I'll work with you. Thank you. Whatever you want. Thank, Thank you, you very much. Thank you. And Chair Clark, I would just um, add that the, the palms do not give us the um, canopy cover that we're that we will be losing. So that's, I would concur with the recommendation that has been made, the motion has been made because of the canopy loss. Yeah, the, the Street Tree Advisory Committee did make um, comments about like leaf mass and how a palm would insufficiently uh, replace what's being lost. So, so yes. So it sounds like you're giving a second. Uh, it was already seconded, I believe, by Commissioner Perry. Okay, and then that was our discussion. Any more discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? And so moved. That brings us to our next item on the agenda. Santa Cruz, oh, not Santa Cruz Boulevard. I think it's Alamar. Mr. Volpe. Yes, uh, Chair Clark and commissioners. The second uh, Street Tree Advisory Committee recommendation for review <laughs> is located at 514 East Alamar. And it is a Southern African coral tree uh, located in the front yard setback. Um, application stating disruption to the driveway and tentative plans to remodel the front yard with uh, replacement trees of two fruit trees. Um, as the advisory committee discussed it, uh, all found that the tree 
pictured below is um, is a valuable tree and and rare in terms of coral trees and doing quite well in that front yard. Um, also discussion across the committee was that there was a very small amount of hardscape damage at this point uh, in the noticed in the driveway. The situation of the tree is quite uh, quite a far away from the actual house. Um, and discussion also went around in terms of just pruning and possibly root doing some minor root pruning as mitigations were um, warranted in the future rather than um, going as far as removal. And so the committee unanimously voted to deny the removal of that setback tree. Thank you, Mr. Volpe. Do we have any questions for him at this time? Uh, Mr. Volpe, doesn't a coral tree prevent any growth beneath it? Couldn't put a lawn there, can't do many and much of landscaping plants. It, it kind of monopolizes its drip line. I would agree with that, yeah. I would like to point out, Commissioner Perry, that if you read the applicant's um, information, they had said that they're interested in putting flagstone under the tree or in the driveway. I don't, I'm not sure they were looking for a lawn. It will, be, it will be replaced by flagstone. Yeah. Uh, I was just commenting the tree itself and the effects of the tree. Mm. They're, okay. they're asking to move it, and that would allow them to do anything they want, lawn or flagstone or pavers. But as it sits, there's nothing you can do under it. Are there any more questions for Mr. Volpe? Yeah, I had just one clarification. Um, I wasn't able to go visit this tree. And so you're saying that the damage to the driveway is pretty minimal. It sounds like in their, you know, letter, they're saying my driveway has been badly damaged. Um, talk to me a little bit more about the driveway damage and the roots. Chair Clark and Commissioner uh, Martinez Cohen uh, when you go out to the site, what what I noticed is um, there there are certainly roots underneath that that uh, panel of driveway that seems to have been placed there in in the recent say five to ten year range, um, added on to what is the normal driveway, and that is slightly lifted. I would say, you know, if you go down to where it meets the sidewalk, it'd be about a half an inch, and there is a slight crack where a buttress root is kind of laterally going out underneath the driveway. Um, again, mitigations for that are usually fairly simple. Mm -hmm. You can basically prune the roots and, and repave and it should be okay. Correct. And additionally, um, a question, Mr. Wolpe, was there some discussion, I believe, by the Street Tree Advisory Committee members about um, the timing of that driveway and whether or not it was permitted when it was put in? Uh, uh, Chair Clark and commissioners, there was, there was a comment made by a, com uh, a committee member uh, as to the way that, that that panel looks, yeah, and whether or not it was permitted and whether it was, um, yeah. Mm. Are there... Were your questions sufficiently answered, Commissioner Martinez Cohen? Uh, yeah, definitely. Okay, do we have any more questions before we see if there is anyone from the public here to speak to this tree? Okay, Rose, do we have anyone from the public who would like to talk about this it, tree? Anyone who wishes to raise, speak on this item, please raise your hand on the GoToWebinar control panel. Uh, we do have a raised hand. It is Elvia Rivero. And again, it's going to take me a minute to transfer over. I am sorry. It's okay. I'll I'll see you guys during the transfer. <laughs> well, okay, Ms. Rivera, um, you will have two minutes to speak. Oh, hold on a second. 
Oh, you are unmuted. Go ahead and speak. You will have two minutes. Okay. Okay. Um, it sounds like you have you have to turn your computer audio off. Uh, if you are on a, there's something going on here. I don't know. I'm gonna mute her for a minute. Yeah. Okay. It is her. Uh, Ms. Rivero, you need to turn down your uh, computer audio because we can hear it and it's it's reverberating, it's echoing, and then we won't be able to hear you properly. So let's turn it down, and then we'll see. I'll unmute you and see what happens. We'll see you then. Uh, Ms. Rivero, do you have a microphone or a headset? Or how are you trying to communicate? I have my. I have the phone. Okay, so you you're using the phone, and no. you're watching on. There we go. Oh, can you speak now? I can't. No, there you go. We can oh, hear, we you. hear you. We hear you. We hear you. Uh. Ms. Rivero? Oh, she just, uh, she's having difficulties. Uh, Ms. Rivero, you, uh, we can hear you if you can speak. I don't know. Well, um, how about if we see um, Ms. Rivero raise her hand at some point later in the meeting, we welcome her back at any time. Okay. All right, she did mute herself again. So Ms. Rivero, if you are able to, okay, hold Can on. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Okay, you Can have you two hear minutes. Me? Yes, ma'am, yeah. you have two minutes. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes. You have two Hello? minutes. Yes. Yeah. Okay. I want to speak about the the uh, front yard and uh, the roots in that tree are totally raised where I cannot uh, remodel and change the, uh, the grass. I'm removing the grass, putting flex stones, and it's impossible because that coral tree has roots that are raised and are very, very difficult. I would not be able to put any flagstone or remodel my front yard. I want to do it to save water. And that's why I don't want grass. I want to put flagstones and uh, and also it's raised, you have to put, a, we use the driveway to park two cars because I have my granddaughters who live with me and uh, we don't have enough um, street parking. So I have to, to do that, uh, put two cars in the driveway. Um, so I was going to replace that tree for uh, fruit trees. I have two fruit trees in the front yard and I wanted to put two more. They're smaller, easier to care for, and they provide fruit as well. So I hope that you, um, will consider that, that I'm trying to uh, remodel my, my front yard and I can't do it with that big tree. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mrs. Rivero. Um, uh, does anybody have any comments? Um, I, I have chair. Commissioner Longstreet. Um, this is a pretty amazing tree. When I went by it today, it really does add to the neighborhood. It's in an area without street trees. So it would be a, um, 
a loss to the entire neighborhood. Um, losing a street tree like that for parking um, is just, it, it would be a real loss in our community and it would be a loss to the resident, I think also it adds value to that home. Mm -hmm. And it is a completely beautiful specimen. So I would support the Street Tree Advisory Committee recommendation. Um, I completely agree with Commissioner Longstreet. I think it would be travesty to remove a tree for parking purposes, although I do sympathize with the difficulty of not having enough parking. Um, I think the characteristic uh, of the neighborhood would be adversely affected by the removal of that tree. Um, I think there are ways to put flagstone down um, despite uneven ground. Um, I do know that uh, planting two young fruit trees will take a lot more water than perhaps um, the resident is aware of. And if uh, saving water is a goal of this project, I think removing an established tree and planting two new ones would not um, reach that goal. Are there any more comments? I have another question for Mr. Volpe, if I may, please. Please, Commissioner Perry. Um, in the scope of this tree's life, would you put this as infantile, adolescent, adult, or senior? Um, I kind of think it's going to outgrow the house. I just don't know when, how, how long it would take. Uh, Chair Clark and Commissioner Perry, uh, I, I would see this tree as adult. Uh, I wouldn't see it getting uh, like say twice the size, um, but uh, I don't have direct information on that right here. And I, I'm, I'm talking from assumption a little bit. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Are there any more comments? Just um, and I would like to. Who's speaking? No, I was just going to answer. It's, it's uh, McGill. Oh, Vice Chair McGill, please. Yeah, yeah. I was just. Um, it just struck me that it's fairly far away from the house, so even if it um, has a fair amount of growth in it, I, I don't see it. it. Yes, it might raise the driveway a bit more, which didn't seem significant compared to some of the others that we have looked at in the even in the recent past. Um, but it's hard to imagine it impinging on the house foundation or anything like that. And it is a beautiful tree. It's a gorgeous tree. Um, I'm, I'm prepared to make a motion if we're ready for that. Please. Um, Are we ready I for that? Yeah. Okay. okay. I, I would um, move that we um, concur with the Street Tree Committee recommendation to deny the setback tree removal request of uh, East Al 514 East Alamar of the Southern African Coral Tree. I'll second. I'll second. Oh, who seconded? Long Street. Okay. Is there any discussion? Okay. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? I'm going to side with the homeowner and say nay. Okay. So moved. Thank you. Um, that brings us. To, uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Volpe, for uh, speaking to the trees today. And we're going to move to our director's report, which is for information. Welcome, um, Ms. Zachary. Chair Clark, commissioners. Uh, it, it's hard to believe it's the end of October. Um, we had a busy summer in Parks and Recreation despite COVID. And we spent even more time trying to get back to where we had some normal operations. So I'm pleased to report that the Arts and Crafts Show was able to reopen. Uh, it's something that we've been working on for some time. Um, you know, working with uh, the artisans on that as well. As you can see from, from your staff report, um, we, we anticipated that we would go from purple to red and that might give us that option to explore opening the arts and crafts show. We spent some time surveying our membership to find out their interest because clearly people have 
varying levels of interest of being out in, in the public um, considering the pandemic. And when we had some that were and some that weren't, so we went ahead and, and made a plan for those that did want to return at the same time placing other memberships on hold. So, so the cost to the show member uh, would not continue to be borne. Obviously it was placed on hold when nothing could happen and that we implemented COVID related procedures so that, that there's a sense of safety uh, for the members and also for the public. Um, and uh, we've worked really closely, I would add, with uh, the county health officer on everything that this department has tried to pursue, knowing there's a fine balance between recreation and open space with making sure we're, that the people are safe. So. Um, it officially opened October 11th. Uh, we had 32 members, which is quite a bit smaller than where we want to get back to for sure. And, and a number of people that were really pleased to see, see that resurgence um, in the beachfront. So we're pleased with that. And we'll see how it goes and we'll continue to monitor it and work closely with the show members in moving forward with other opportunities as hopefully conditions continue to improve. Also, uh, we started a construction project, which is always exciting uh, for Parks and Recreation. We've been working on a renovation project for Bonet for some time. We had a really wonderful plan that involved doing a lot of different neat things. Unfortunately, the funding we were trying to secure did not come forth. So we had to scale the project back um, and take advantage of a little bit of general fund money and then also some community development block grant funds. Uh, at the same time, the Creeks Division uh, was interested in doing a subsurface stormwater treatment system in the park. Uh, you, as we all know, parks are great places to, to do these types of things because they're already public property and it's a way for us to uh, make improvements to the community using public property. So we combine the two projects so they're done hand in hand. And if you go past Bonnet today, you'll see there's a big hole in the ground. So, that, so the stormwater treatment project's going in the playing field. Uh, the grassy area, which isn't really a playing field, but it's it's used that way. Um, it gets constructed first, um, and then when it gets complete, we will get some new turf for the park, so the park um, users will benefit. We'll also be doing some more accessibility improvements. Uh, we'll be doing another uh, family picnic area. Um, the things that we won't be doing, which which are unfortunate, but the way we're building the project, it won't preclude us uh, from expanding the area that's now considered the basketball handball area, making that actually larger so we can do multi-court sports there. We don't have the funding for that kind of thing, but we can certainly go back in at a later date and install that. I, I mentioned perhaps in a, in a prior report that we completed the renovation of the restroom at Bonet during COVID that was CDBG funded as well. And it was the portion of the project we could carve out and do as a standalone, knowing that we needed to wait um, until the fall to do the rest of the project. Uh, we anticipate the park will be closed through the end of the calendar year and into January. Uh, the upper portion that's next to San Andres Street is open and uh, we'll do our darndest to, to get it open as quickly as possible. And that's all, unless there's questions from the commission on other things going on. Thank you, Ms. Zachary. Do we, do we have any questions? I had one quick kind of odd one. Mm -hmm. um, with the arts and crafts show, I see that there's going to be a new market, a Thursday market on State Street through the holiday season at least. Has there been any discussion or concern about um, that having an impact one way or the other on the arts and crafts show? Or are they seen as just really so separate that it won't matter? Uh, Chair Clark and Commissioner McGill, there has been discussion uh, that the Thursday market is part of uh, the downtown Santa Barbara's agreement with the city. Again, the efforts to bring people into the downtown area. <clears throat> Uh, a market on a Thursday evening is vastly different than a market on a, on a weekend day. Um, and, and it's our hope and intention that there wouldn't be cross competition. If they were at the same time, which we, there is a market that, that pops up in Paseo Nuevo on the weekends. That's if anything, more of a consideration for our arts and crafts show people, you know, that kind of competition. Uh, but we're mindful of that and we're monitoring how it goes uh, and, 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 with the idea that the, it wouldn't conflict with the arts and crafts show. Wouldn't preclude arts and crafts artisans from being part of that Thursday market if that's what they wanted to do as well. 
but thanks. Thank you. I would think it would open a venue for them. Mm -hmm. I would hope. Yeah. They'd be open for business two days a week instead of one. Yeah. Are there more questions for Ms. Zachary? No? With that, I'm really stoked about this one. We're going to move to the Westmont College Acorn Woodpecker Study. So Chair Clark and Commissioners, we have two students from um, Westmont College to present this to you. And I want to give them some a little kudos in advance because their professor reached out to us mm -hmm. in the middle of COVID and said, we'd really like to do this. So number one, it's great that they're, they've done this work. It's great that a city park could be uh, one of the sites that they chose. And then I'd also just like to, to acknowledge them for asking and working with us. And, and one, one thing I asked in return is if they would come to the commission and do a presentation for you. So with that, well, I'll turn it over to Kendra and Seth. Thank you. Thank you, welcome. Thank you guys. Um, Thank my you. name is Kendra. And I'm Seth. Um, and we are student researchers uh, with Dr. Amanda Sparkman's lab with the biology department at Westmont College. And uh, we recently have been working on a study on acorn woodpeckers and looking at the effects of urbanization on their daily activity patterns and um, their reproduction. Next slide. So first, I'd just like to acknowledge a couple of the people that made this study possible. We have a couple of field assistants, um, Kelly Evans, which is a staff, she is a staff researcher, and then Jessica Wright and Isabel Huguenoit, um, who are our research assistants who observed with us in the field. Um, and then funding from Westmont College and, and the provost office uh, made our summer research assistantships um, possible. And we'd also like to thank uh, Parks and Rec and Santa Barbara County Parks for allowing us to um, sample in your guys' parks during the early morning hours and the and late after the hours. Um, next slide, please. Okay, so I'm going to start out giving you guys a little bit of background uh, on the ecology of urban wildlife. So urban ecology is gonna be defined as the study of ecosystems in the context of urban landscapes. And so as you could imagine, this comes with a deal of challenges. Uh, for one, you see challenges in community composition, which just sort of refers to the amount of species and their distribution. You also see changes in resource availability, um, reduced availability in their natural resources, such as water, water source um, and plants. You also see the effects of roads and traffic um, from their sheer invasiveness, but also uh, the danger they pose as species try to cross. Um, you have impervious surfaces, which go hand in hand with roads uh, because these are just typically artificial surfaces, um, including roads and homes and roofs or sort of anything that are covered and water resistant. Um, you also have environmental toxins, uh, which can come from waste, households, vehicles, um, industrial and commercial manufacturing, um, et cetera, et cetera. And then um, uh, important to our particular study, you have noise pollution, which is um, human induced noise from cars, homes, machinery, um, you name it. And this can often make communication between species difficult and inhibit certain cues they use to communicate with one another. Um, and then also prominent to our study, light pollution, uh, which comes from headlights, streetlights, flashlights, um, anything like that. Uh, and this can often cause desensitivities and potentially disrupt circadian rhythms uh, in some of these species. Next slide, please. Okay, so now looking a little bit more specifically uh, at the behavior ecology of urban birds, there's actually pretty widespread evidence uh, of altered behavior in urban birds. Uh, for one, we see stress-reduced response or habituation and this is typically just diminishing or altering a, partic a particular species uh, physiological or emotional response from a repeated stimulus or stimuli, uh, which you could imagine are pretty abundant in urban landscapes. Um, you also have effects on reproductive phenology, which is just the natural cycles and patterns that are associated with the reproduction of species. 
um, daily rhythms, uh, in particular light pollution can actually affect behavioral and uh, physiological effects. It can alter their daily and seasonal rhythms. Um, and then vocalization, uh, looking specifically at noise pollution, a lot of times this can affect uh, their foraging and anti-predator behavior, uh, reproductive success, um, and often community structure. Next slide. So our study species is the acorn woodpecker, and you guys may have seen them around town in, by our house. Um, they have an iconic red uh, plumage on top of their head, and um, they're actually quite common in urban, more urban areas. Um, and a lot of what we know about them comes from extensive research that's been done at the Hastings Re Reservation in Northern California. Um, but there really hasn't been a ton of work on them or no work as far as we know, um, uh, looking at them in an urban um, setting. So a couple key um, parts of these birds biology is that they are cavity nesting. So that means you can see in the picture below, um, there's a chick inside of a cavity. Um, so at night, um, when they go to sleep, they return to a cavity inside of a tree or a telephone pole in urban areas. Um, and then they also have granaries. Um, again, in the photo with the chick, you can see right below the cavity, there are holes in the tree. Um, and this is where the acorn woodpeckers store their acorns during the fall and then use them as a food source throughout the year. Um, and then finally, acorn woodpeckers are a social species. They're cooperatively breeding. So what that means is that they um, uh, live in groups and breed in groups and there can be multiple breeding individuals, males and females, um, that the females uh, will lay their eggs in the same cavity. And um, then as those chicks grow up, they will all take care of them collectively. Um, and then within these groups, there can also be non-breeding individuals. So individuals that provide care to the chicks that are, um, that are not actually their parents. And these breeding individuals are normally um, from the last year's um, offspring. Um, next slide. So the questions that we asked in this study um, are, does degree of urbanization affect daily activity patterns um, and reproductive success? So as far as the daily activity patterns, that looks at what time they're waking up, what time they're going to sleep, what sort of activity is happening around those times. And our prediction uh, was that urban woodpeckers would begin activity earlier and cease activity later than rural woodpeckers um, because of the anthropogenic light and noise that is associated with urban areas. And then as far as reproductive success, um, we predicted that urban woodpeckers would be associated with having fewer fledglings, um, so a decrease in reproductive success. Next slide. So here is our uh, study map um, where the yellow dots represent our sites that we um, visited and observed um, their family groups of woodpeckers and observed their behavior. And then um, the blue dots represent active granaries. As you can see, there's many across Santa Barbara. And then this map is generated. Um, it's a GIS map. And so the lighter areas represent um, high light. Um, and the, the less light areas represent low light. And then as you can see, there's a um, little, little cluster of yellow dots. Um, and that is at Westmont. We surveyed um, uh, a few of our families that we had at Westmont, and we actually saw quite a bit of variability um, just within that small area, which was really interesting um, considering we're looking at differences between urban and wild. That's within this small area, there was quite a bit of variability. Next slide. Okay, so here to our first question, does the degree of urbaniza urbanization affect daily activity patterns? Um, next slide. 
Um, and before we get into that, I'm just going to run you through our methods. Um, and also, as I speak, if we could have this video on the right plate, if that's possible. Um, we This is a video actually in the morning, uh, a, a family of eight different individuals um, leaving the cavity as they wake up. So um, basically we observed 20 different families across the urban gradient in Santa Barbara. Eight of these sites were deemed urban and 12 rural. Um, urban was defined as having high anthropogenic light and noise and alternatively rural was low anthropogenic light and noise. Uh, so we used rural sort of rough loosely here um, because a lot of these rural sites were actually in city parks but gave us a, a, a good comparison. Um, so now the key variables we looked at um, at each site were first and last signs of activity in the morning and in the evening. Uh, this could include seeing them emerge from the cavity or hearing them uh, as they were waking up or before they went to bed. Um, and then we also we recorded the number of vocalizations for five minutes um, and then recorded these 35 minutes before and after sunrise and then 20 minutes before and after sun, uh, sunset. And so these vocalizations basically were important in engaging the level of activity of the particular groups. Um, and also while we we're there, we recorded a good deal of data from the vocalizations of other bird species we heard, um, but we wound up also just including uh, crow vocalizations uh, since we have uh, a solid um, data set there and it was a good comparison. Next slide. Okay, so um, here we have our earliest, earliest and latest activity results. Uh, so on the left, we have earliest activity in minutes to sunrise uh, for both groups and then latest activity minutes after sunrise on the right for both groups. And so here you can see our woodpeckers are gonna be um, shown as circles, our crows as squares. And so here in our first graph, we see that um, actual urban woodpeckers begin activity in the morning significantly earlier than our rural woodpeckers, which is um, the opposite of what we expected. And then as for our crows, uh, they were as predicted and our urban crows actually began activity later than our rural crows. And then looking at our, our um, table to the right, we have our latest activity. So in the evenings, uh, we didn't see a significant difference between our rural and urban woodpecker group, uh, but our crows followed the same trend um, and our urban crows actually went to bed later than our rural. Next slide, please. Okay, and now just looking at vocalizations, uh, we on the left, uh, we have the percentage of five minute intervals uh, with vocalizations. And on the right, we just have sheer vocalizations. Uh, so as you can see on the left, at both, and this is just for woodpeckers, at both sunrise and sunset, our urban woodpeckers vocalized at less frequent intervals. And then looking at number of vocalizations, uh, we didn't see a significant difference in the morning, but in the evening, uh, our urban woodpeckers vocalized less per interval than our rural woodpeckers. Next slide. Okay, so what does all this mean? Why are these woodpeckers in more urban environments sleeping in? Uh, we have a few hypotheses and these aren't mutually exclusive. Uh, so it could be one, it could be a combination, um, but this is what we came up with. Uh, so our first is our light sensitivity hypothesis, uh, deemed that urban woodpeckers become desynthesized to natural light. Uh, so with the natural light I mentioned before, there are street lights, uh, headlights, that sort of thing. Uh, with them being so present and um, into the evening and in the morning, uh, this actually has caused our woodpeckers to um, not rely as much on the cues that come from our natural light from the sun uh, because they're so prevalent into the night um, as they wouldn't be. Number two, we have our stress hypothesis, and that's that human stressors actually tire the urban woodpeckers during the day leading them to less rest longer. Uh, and this is just that as woodpeckers navigate uh, these stressors that we produce uh, through um, or an urban lifestyle, it taxes them so much that they just need to sleep longer uh, during the night. And that's why they wake up a little bit later. Um, number three, we have our anthropogenic noise hypothesis. And this is that human induced noise causes communication to be actually less effective in the morning and making it dangerous to emerge from the cavity. And this is that the woodpeckers actually choose not to emerge as early because um, 
of all these uh, noises that don't allow them to communicate, which is important as they wake up and communicate one, for one with each other uh, when they leave the cavity. And also uh, there's, they have roosts where other members of the family um, will sometimes sleep, which also inhibits that communication, which is vital. Um, and lastly, we have our natural noise hypothesis. And this is that in low light areas, there actually may be higher biodiversity, which leads to more birds singing. Uh, and this serves as a cue to wake up the rural woodpeckers. Uh, and so uh, as you would expect uh, in these more rural sites, you, there are more birds and more birds singing in the morning. And it's the woodpeckers actually may um, rely on this, this sort of noise as a cue as opposed to the sun or maybe a combination. But regardless, you might not see as many uh, and less biodiversity in these urban sites. Uh, and therefore this might explain why they're sleeping in. Next slide. So now that we know that uh, urban birds, woodpeckers wake up later than rural woodpeckers, um, we wanted to see if this might be associated with a uh, change in reproductive success between urban and rural woodpeckers. Next slide. So we used the same um, 20 sites that we used for the original behavioral study. Um, we were actually watching them during the reproductive period during the summer. So we were able to visit them as their um, chicks were fledging. And then we also included eight additional sites that um, we had found throughout Santa Barbara that we returned to and monitored um, the uh, fledgling fledging success of those groups. Um, and if the video can play, I'll just explain how we determined what fledglings are. So as you can see here, that is a chick, a nestling. It has not fledged yet and it is being provisioned at the cavity. So one way um, that we identified um, fledglings, because once they come out of the cavity, it's difficult to tell the difference between the um, adults and fledglings. Um, they have male-like plumage um, and they also have dark eyes um, and exhibit a different sort of vocalization and beg for food from their parents. So that was a good vis visualization of what a cavity looks like and what um, a chick being provisioned and um, taken care of by other adults looks like. Um, next slide. And then so for our results for reproductive success, um, we actually found no difference in the proportion of groups reproductive between rural um, and urban woodpeckers, uh, nor the annual number of fledglings between rural and urban woodpeckers. So um, although we saw a difference in um, uh, activity levels in the evenings and the mornings, uh, we did not see any difference in reproductive success. Next slide. Um, so to summarize, there is a difference between daily rhythms in urban and rural acorn woodpeckers, um, but these differences are not associated with reduced reproductive success based on this study. Um, this might suggest that they're adaptive, that um, meaning that the urban woodpeckers, because they're waking up early, are maybe um, mitigating for negative effects of urbanization, or they could also just be neutral. We don't know right now, and we'd like to do more studies to try and untangle that a little bit more. And so some further questions that we have are, um, can acorn woodpeckers withstand any amount of light and sound pollution? Um, Santa Barbara is not the peak of urbanization. They're not skyscrapers in downtown Santa Barbara. So one of the questions that we have are, um, is where does that point uh, exist that acorn woodpeckers can no longer exist in an urban environment? And then similarly, are there other limiting factors in urban areas besides um, light and noise pollution, such as um, resource availability? They use acorns as a food source and um, there may be a difference in um, oak trees um, prevalence in urban versus rural areas. Uh, next slide. So because of these questions that we continue to have, um, we have a couple of ongoing projects, um, such as looking at the effects of short day length on daily activity patterns. 
um, differences in group size and sex ratio, as well as urban occupancy models, which will hopefully get at the question of where do urban woodpecker families exist within um, the variation of landscape throughout the urban areas. Next slide. So thank you guys so much for having us. It was such a pleasure to tell everyone about our, um, the research that we've done and get to share that with you all. And we'd like to take questions if anyone has any. Um, thank you so much. That was amazing, right up my alley. Um, I, I had a question and I hope you do more research in our parks and open spaces and come back to us again. Um, but I had a question. When you, did you examine the role of predators, rural versus urban predators on the woodpeckers biorhythms and waking and going to bedtimes? No, so we actually have not done that. It's very difficult to quantify that sort of thing, mm -hmm. as you might imagine. Um, but it is interesting to think about, okay, cats, they play a role and are known as a notorious bird nabbers um, versus like Cooper's hawks that are might be more prevalent in um, more rural areas. That is an interesting question, but we haven't looked at it at all. And how many fledglings do they have per clutch? Um, so based on our uh, data, it's about one to three. Three was the most number per clutch. One was the least with one probably being most of the groups, but um, the clutch size, I don't, I don't know exactly the number, but in the Hastings reservation, um, I think that it was higher there. Okay. Based on their data. Yeah. And one final question, I didn't notice if you covered it or not. Did, is there a difference in survival rate between the fledglings in an urban environment versus the rural environment? Or is that something that would also be really hard to tell in a short-term study like this? Uh, yeah, so that was one of the questions that we asked, um, and we did not see a, a difference between okay. the two um, based on our data for this season. Thank you. Does anyone else have questions? No, but I just want to echo the appreciation. Um, it's just been great fun. We have so many of these woodpeckers in our neighborhood, and it's just been um fun learning more about it, but also it's a, it's a really great use of our parks and mm -hmm. um, really encourage more of it. I don't know if there's other researchers um, like you at Westmont who are interested in doing research in our, our parks and open spaces, but I know that the department's going to be doing some monarch work out at the DFP, and I think it would be really interesting to look at. Um, we have some pretty pretty strong parasite um, problems with our monarch populations in Santa Barbara. And I think it would be interesting to look at how those affect the monarchs in our, in, at the Douglas Family Preserve. If anyone's out there listening and is interested, they can talk to me at ITS. Anybody else? Chair no? Clark and, and commissioners, I would just jump in and add that that we work with other organizations like right now the Santa Barbara Botanic Garden in terms of they're doing collection of plants and seeds um, to support the native plant population. So where we do have open spaces, we often have a, a, a significant interest in how, uh, how they can support natural communities. Um, and, and luckily we've got researchers and and people in nonprofit organizations that are interested in pursuing those, because that that's exactly what we'd like to be able to provide as well. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And Kendra and Seth, if you answer your questions, uh, we'd be happy to have you come back and talk to us about your um, ongoing efforts. So thank you very much. Thank you, guys. Thank you again. Mm -hmm. Um, and that brings us to a rental facility video tour information. Hello, Parks and Recreation Commission. Can you hear me? 
Hello, Ms. Case. I can hear you. Okay. Uh, hello, I'm Summers Case, Marketing Coordinator for the Parks and Recreation Department. And I'm here to tell you about our new venue video tours. Uh, for some context, the Parks and Recreation Department has 10 indoor rental venues available for anything from large wedding receptions to small business meetings. And although we're not holding events right now, we are taking reservations for future events. Pre-pandemic, the rental process would involve hearing about one of our venues and then contacting the department to arrange an in-person tour. Most often these tours were led by hourly employees. Uh, now, during the pandemic, the department has fewer hourly employees to conduct these tours and in-person tours may be seen as less safe by our potential customers. To make up for this, the department contracted with Wellborn Media to produce video tours of our venues so people can view the spaces from the comfort of their own homes or phones to help them decide whether or not a City of Santa Barbara venue is right for them. Although our conversion rate for customers who come in for an in-person tour is already high, the new video tours may help customers self-select out before seeking an in-person tour, which maximizes the efficient use of our staff time. It's also seen as very standard now for venues to have video tours available online. So providing these videos keeps us competitive. And as you know, the Cabrillo Pavilion and Chase Palm Park Center each have a new look since they've been remodeled. So event planners, vendors, and others familiar with the old look can take a peek inside too. The first video we, we produced with Wellborn Media features the Cabrillo Pavilion, and that's the video I'm going to show you in just a moment. But please do visit our YouTube channel or, or our venue's web pages to take a look at the others. You can find those pages at santabarbaraca.gov slash venues. There you can see all four of the venues from the first phase of production, the Cabrillo Pavilion, the Carousel House, Casa Las Palmas, and the Chase Palm Park Center. In the coming months, we'll have two more videos to release, one featuring our neighborhood centers and one to show off the historic Carrillo Recreation Center and Ballroom. With that, we will play our Cabrillo Pavilion video for you and I'll be back afterwards. Thank you.
Wow. I'm hearing some reverberation. I am too. Yes, I am too. Okay, I tried meeting myself. I don't think it is me. Um, I'll just continue. So I mentioned before that each video is hosted on our YouTube channel and embedded on each venue's page on our website. And I'd like to add before I close that descriptions and fully functional subtitles are included with each video in both English and Spanish to expand our reach and keep us in line with best practices for accessibility. So thank you for your time and I'm here to answer any questions. Thank you, Summers. I actually went to the venue's webpage and watched uh, three of the videos today and almost wanted to get married again. Um, they were that good, but I said no. Um, wonderful marketing tool. Um, and I like the fact that it's going to decrease person to person contact. You know, people can weed themselves out by looking at the video first. I think that's an excellent idea. Nicole, can someone send us the link to that website so we can see those videos? Yeah, we can get that sent out. It's, um, I just, I looked at my agenda and I typed it into my browser and it was really, really easy to find. But, mm -hmm. um, Ms. Case, could you email the link? Uh, Chair Clark, Commissioner Perry, I would be happy to. Oh, thank you so much. Yeah, the and video it, was really cool. Um, I haven't had the chance to go into the pavilion yet, so that was really great to see all the amazing upgrades. Um, the kitchen and the bathrooms especially are a big, big difference. So good job. The video seemed very professional. It like definitely made me want to go there. <laughs> Thank you. And the music made me want to dance. It was good all around. Are there any more comments or questions? Okay. Um, thank you, Summers. Uh, with that, we will move to a presentation on the Thousand Steps Repair Project, which is for action. Chair Clark and Commissioners Andrew Brumond, who is our new Capital Project Supervisor, will be doing uh, this presentation. Andrew, I think, is in his fourth week in Parks and Recreation. And um, just as a quick introduction for the commission, he's worked for the city for 14 years. He was a project planner with the airport department, um, very well versed in project development, project implementation, permitting, uh, it runs the gamut. So we're very pleased that uh, Andrew jumped over to Parks and Recreation to work with uh, the team that we have here. And with that, I'll turn it over to Andrew. Okay. Thank you, Madam Chair, Commission, and uh, Ms. Zachary for the introduction. Um, the uh, item before you today is the uh, repair of the Thousand Steps uh, Coastal Access Staircase um, uh, down at uh, the end of Santa Cruz Boulevard. Um, anyone who's been there lately is aware of the fact that it is, as you can see on the title slide, um, starting to crumble apart and is uh, presenting a bit of a safety hazard. So I'm lucky to have this as one of my first projects to uh, take forward uh, next week. We will be going to the Planning Commission and ultimately we'll be going to the State Coastal Commission. Um, could you advance to the next slide, please? All right, so I'm just going to quickly go over the safety issues uh, that we've identified and then the proposed repairs that are a part of the project. Um, the major issues that are going before both Planning Commission and Coastal Commission are um, the preservation of historic resources and addressing coastal resources, in particular coastal hazards. So I'll go through each of those briefly. Um, next slide, please. So the safety issues are maybe self-evident. Uh, we have a number of cracks that are presenting um, uh, both uh, trip hazards as well as uh, the potential for um, slide. We have an, a, a lot of groundwater infiltration uh, from the uh, adjacent community that's uh, seeping through the, uh, through the bluff face and into uh, the staircase creating uh, a slip hazard in addition to uh, a, a trip hazard. Um, we also have down at the bottom an occasional sudden drop. The last step uh, ends uh, at the beach level when we have adequate sand supply. 
but especially during a heavy winter storm, we will have the sand supply move offshore where we'll end up with just cobble and you'll have a substantial drop, sometimes several feet, uh, which itself is a safety hazard. Next slide, please. So uh, our solution uh, for the lower portion is to uh, extend the staircase into what is currently sand. Um, but uh, so that way, whatever the sand level is, we'll have stairs that alight to that level. Uh, we would add 10 additional steps. We would also include not just at the bottom, but for the entire length uh, handrails so that um, you'll be able to um, navigate safely. Next slide, please. We'll also be restoring a portion of uh, the uh, landing where uh, the railing and the columns have are either completely destroyed or partially uh, crumbling away. Um, so we'll be restoring those as a part of this project as well to the uh, original design. Uh, next slide, please. So as a historic resource, these stairs are nearly a century old. They were designed in 1923 and um, designated by city council as Camino Al Mar public right of way. Um, they were uh, completed in 1925 and then in 1975, they went through substantial repair. Uh, and then there were additional repairs done in the 1990s. Um, through our uh, consultation with the Historic Landmarks Commission, they were deemed a eligible structure of merit. So we're treating them as a historic resource appropriately. Next slide, please. Uh, can we advance the next slide? All right, so these are the, uh, all right, <laughs> I'll go with this. The, um, the Mesa looked very different at the time that the stairs were constructed. Uh, part of the reason that these stairs are uh, constructed in concrete and uh, were done in arts and crafts and Spanish colonial revival architectural styles was that the city had uh, an influx of revenue associated with the oil drilling that was occurring at the time. Uh, so all of these uh, uh, oil derricks, of course, are now part of the neighborhood. We no longer allow that sort of thing, but um, it's amazing what 100 years can do to a community. Uh, next slide, please. The 1,000 steps were completed and, uh, in 1925, and I apologize, I don't know the name of the woman in this photograph, but this is the their original condition when they were constructed where... Uh, the uh, story that we found in our historic research was that they got the nickname Thousand Steps from the contractor who said that the construction of 150 steps was more like constructing a thousand steps. The job was so difficult. Um, can we advance the next slide? So you can see by the 1970s, they were in a very poor shape uh, where the uh, columns had completely fallen apart, uh, the stairs were washing away. And so on the next slide, we show the restoration that was done in uh, 1975. And if we advance again, we'll see uh, their condition today. And, uh, or in 2015, actually, because we, I wanted to show the uh, maximum extent when we have uh, the sand supply basically completely gone to bedrock you end up with, that's about a three and a half foot lip there. Uh, next slide, please. So uh, earlier this year, just as a safety measure, we used uh, permeable concrete on the bottom 12 steps to uh, reform those so that they would be uh, level, evenly spaced. And um, also by using permeable concrete, we're hoping to uh, mitigate some of that water seepage that is occurring so that instead of having it pooling on the surface where you'll get algae and a, a slip hazard, it could infiltrate sort of through the stair. Uh, next slide, please. So we've taken this project twice to the Historic Landmarks Commission or rather my predecessor did. Um, in uh, 2019, uh, the project was referred to Planning Commission for uh, consideration of a permit as well as uh, in uh, October for the uh, adoption of the Historic Structures Report. It will return to uh, the Historic Landmarks Commission for one more review following um, the 
the other entitlements, which are coastal development permit. Next slide, please. Additionally, as we can see, when the tide is high, the stairs are in the ocean for portions of the day, um, and that produces another design challenge. Um, we prepared a wave uprush study to evaluate the um, both the existing condition and the existing uh, hazard as it exists with uh, storm surge, but also the uh, exacerbated uh, storm surge potential with the incorporation of sea level rise. And so we found that the uh, in what's called the 100 year storm or the 1% interval storm, the uh, waves today would uprush to about 22 feet, which is uh, a, a small landing on the stairs. And um, with five and a half feet of sea level rise, which is what the Coastal Commission anticipates as the highest reasonable likelihood for the year 2100, we could be looking at double that in your worst case storm uh, going up to 44 feet, which would be just below the, uh, the landing that had the pergola on it. Um, can we advance to the next slide, please? So our next steps for this project are to take it to the uh, Planning Commission next week. That'll be at 1 p.m. Uh, just like this. It will be an online meeting. Uh, your link is uh, available there um, to participate. Um, what we're, the Planning Commission is specifically being asked to do is recommend that the California Coastal Commission take up a coastal development permit because uh, both Planning Commission and California Co Coastal Commission share jurisdiction. Uh, we basically cross the boundary when we get onto the sandy beach where we're in state jurisdiction. So rather than breaking the project into two separate permits and having them cover one eye and the other, we just said, let's take the entire project up to the state. So Planning Commission will consider that recommendation. And uh, if we move on to our last slide, um, staff's recommendation to the Parks and Rec Commission is that you recommend that recommendation. <laughs> it's a, a lot of recommending, I'm afraid, but um, the recommendation is just that you uh, receive the report, which you've just done, and uh, recommend to Planning Commission that they take the action I've described. And uh, with that, I can take any questions. Thank you. Um, thank you, and also welcome. Thanks. Do we have any? Do we have any questions for Mr. Bermont at this time? No, I would just thank you for an informative report. Um, I had no idea there was that much oil on the Mesa. That was a really crazy photo from a hundred years ago. Um, I obviously I, I've been in San Bar for like fifteen years, so. But I don't um, know. I don't know a lot of the history. I mean, I knew there was a lot of oil, but that was a trip. That's crazy to see that. Um, I'm so glad that we fixed that, and it doesn't look like that anymore. Um, it's also crazy how old those steps are. I uh, didn't realize that. So yeah, this is great. I I, I would be ready to make a motion, but um, I'll let I, my other colleagues comment. I'm, I'm wondering if, um, since it is for action, do we need to ask whether there's anyone from the public here to speak on this agenda item? If we're done with questions, that is for Mr. Beaumont. I have one. Um, Commissioner Perry, please. Uh, will the percola be restored and then for Andrea? There, there were wells there into the 60s, still functioning. Oh, oh my goodness. Uh, so, Madam Chair and Commissioner Perry, the, uh, the pergola columns will be reconstructed as a part of this project, but the original redwood uh, pergola will, is not included. Um, that's both a cost savings measure, but it's, it's also uh, a recognition that uh, Redwood in this location is is going to deteriorate quickly, and that would not um, we wouldn't be setting that project up for success by using a uh, a project that, or material that would be falling apart again. That's unfortunate. It was a meaningful pass through. Chair, Chair Clark and Commissioners, if I could just add, and and Commissioner Longstreet will reach back to 2007 when this project was first in our capital program. It got defunded as a result of the economic downturn. 
Um, we're fortunate that we have refugio oil mitigation funds allocated for this project. That is how we are going to be able to get it done. Um, the, the, it is a safety, it's a, it's a repair and maintenance mm -hmm. project essentially. And in going to the Historic Landmarks Commission, we pr pr proposed a project and had a historic structure site report prepared that demonstrated that this repair would not adversely affect the historic significance of the staircase. And that at a future date, if the city was in a position to expend additional funds, um, could return the staircase to its original, quote unquote, original condition. So we're really balancing on the fact that this is critical coastal access. The city has policies in its coastal plan that, that prioritize coastal access. It's a historic um, structure in the city. Um, and really, it, it was built in, in a drainage swale, like so many things seem to be built in drainage swales, because once upon it was a path. Why? Well, it was probably the easiest place to get down, just like Mesa Lane steps, built in a drainage swale. And so as a result, we have to manage and repair the stairs you know, every couple of decades, perhaps. Uh, and this 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 goal is not only to do that, but as Mr. Vermont indicated, our proposal to extend the stairs 12, 12 steps further is really to ensure under those adverse sand loss conditions, people can safely get to the beach. Because right now, there are times where you are climbing down three feet to get to the beach and people will still try to do that and that's not a good solution so we're hopeful uh, that we will get permission to to do that and we and it'll be done in a way and it's proposed in a way that um doesn't affect the historic integrity of the structure thank you um madam chair uh -huh. commissioner along the street yes it is nice to see this project moving forward because all of our um, bluff coastal access has been difficult over the years to maintain and you know there's to get the funding they're expensive projects but they are really important to the members of our community so I'm really happy to see this moving forward mm -hmm. thank you and a source of funding tied to it yeah agreed um so um, I, I'm going to just, Ms. Navarra is going to ask if there's anybody that wants to speak to this item before we um, entertain a motion. Uh, Chair Clark, yes, we have Mr. O Oaks would like to speak. And again, I'm sorry, but we'll have to have a slight transition here. Okay. Okay. Mr. Oaks, I am unmuting you. You will have two minutes to speak. Okay. Oh, uh, 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 we live on Santa Cruz Boulevard, so we're really close to those steps. And we think it's great that they're uh, redoing the steps because it's been slick and we've seen many people slide down them before. Our only, uh, our only concern is that they extend the steps and the wall out if he thinks there will be any problem like when the water uh, is up, that you'll have to walk out further out in the water in order to get away from the wall that kind of goes around with the handrails. That would be our, our, our only concern. Uh, hopefully he's kind of looked at that and considered that on how you would get out of the stairway structure if the steps are down in the water. But that's all. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Oaks. Um, may I ask that Mr. Vermont responds? Uh, Madam Chair, I'd be happy to. Uh, Thank you. While we're extending the, we're proposing to extend the staircase uh, 10 steps and the, uh, the handrail would uh, continue along uh, with the stairs. We're not extending the wall. We'll leave the wall in its uh, current location, or rather it's restored location, it's original location. So only the handrails will extend. That does create a slight protrusion, depending on what the sand level is. You'll have, um, uh, you could have the, the handrails stick uh, to navigate around if you're walking laterally along the beach. Um, but if they would be uh, in high sand situations, they would be buried in the, um, 
to be buried in the sand, so you'd be walking over them without even realizing it. In low sand supply situations, you will be walking quite a bit further out into the water. Thank you. Thank you. Um, or you can climb sense. up and over the steps. I suppose that would be available. And and Chair Clark and Commissioners, if I, if I would add, in low sand supplies today and high tides, you are walking off the steps into rocks that you can't see. So really, what we're trying yes. to do is right. is facilitate access. When the water's that high, there's not a lot of places you can go on the beach because really it's right up mm -hmm. at the base of, of the coastal bluff. Um, Correct. It's, um, Correct. It's definitely a, a greater safety situation with renovation. Um, with that, I would, I would like to make a motion that the commission recommends to the planning commission that this project be submitted to the Coastal Commission for a consolidated coastal development permit. I'll second. Is there any discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? So moved. Thank you for that presentation, Mr. Vermont. Um, that brings us to a proposed municipal code amendments pertaining to special events in the city of Santa Barbara. And this is for information. There he is. Chair Clark and commissioners, uh, this is just a follow up to the August commission report where the department brought forward a uh, new approach to a comprehensive citywide process for permitting special events. Uh, as part of that process, um, we have been working to develop the supporting ordinances um, that provide the framework for implementation of the citywide process. Uh, we went before the uh, ordinance committee yesterday with the new ordinance, which you have included in your packet. Mm -hmm. um, and <clears throat> essentially what we were asking for prior to moving forward this forward to city council was that in chapter 15, sorry, Title 15 of the Recreation Beaches and Parks chapter of the Municipal Code, that we add a new section, Chapter 15.17, that will specifically deal with special events in city parks, on city beaches, streets, sidewalks, and plazas. And as part of that, we had to uh, repeal a section of Title IX in the public peace and safety changes, and that was Chapter 9.12 as it relates to permits and regulations for parades, athletic events, and other events requiring the close of streets and other public rights of ways. So that was contained in a different chapter and now exists as part of Chapter 15.17, which again will provide the framework as we move forward for uh, a comprehensive citywide special event permitting process. Uh, at the conclusion of the uh, meeting yesterday, the <clears throat> ordinance was forwarded to City Council. We had a tentative date to go and make a presentation on December 10th. The Ordinance Committee has asked the department to do some further outreach to include other community groups and um, some of the social clubs that are in town beyond our stakeholder group that's in our database for event organizers that have had events in the past, just to make sure we have a full comprehensive outreach to the community. Uh, so we plan on undertaking that uh, late in November, early December, and our plan is to be back uh, for city council adoption uh, December 15th at this point. And at that's, this time, I'd be happy to answer any questions uh, as it relates to the information that was contained in your packet. Um. I, I can't see you. I'm assuming this was Mr. Hanna. I'm, I'm going blind just by. Correct, Chair <laughs> Clark. I'm, so, I'm sorry. Yeah, I, I, I'm sorry. I missed that. Yes, Rich Hanna, Recreation Manager. Sorry. Yeah, everyone. Everyone else knows who you are because they can see your name. I just went by your your voice. But does anyone have any questions for Mr. Hanna? I know yeah. we talked about this at length in August. Rich. So I just I just raised my hand, but obviously didn't see that. Um, oh, I, um, yeah, um, Vice yeah. Chair McGill, and after that, I believe Commissioner Perry. Yeah, the only question, I mean, real question I would have is, is there anything, reading through the material, it looked like it's fundamentally the same as what we discussed back the last time we discussed it, but um, were there any significant changes? And the one thing that in particular of note, the uh, ordinance committee, that, that First Amendment, that whole discussion around First Amendment um, events, it, 
was flagged there as it was here? Um, and were there any draft changes that came about or anything that we need to understand better as a result of, of those discussions? Uh, Chair Clark and Commissioner, Vice Chair Commissioner McGill. So um, prior to presenting to the Ordinance Committee based on feedback we received from the Commission, uh, we did make a fundamental change in terms of how uh, First Amendment events would proceed through the uh, the permitting process. We made a comprehensive decision that a uh, event, first event, first amendment event that didn't require any infrastructure like stages and electricity and those types of things that were true in the moment, they'd mm -hmm. be able to submit an anonymous uh, notification to the department so that we would actually have uh, context for the size and scope of that event and make sure that any necessary resources would be in place to ensure the safety of participants and the public in and around that event. So rather than actually make it a formal process where they went through the special event permitting process, um, we went with more of a notification, which was something that we heard from the commission in addition to following the social media um, and obviously calls that we get at the last minute regarding these events. The, to, be, to be clear, the, the discussion around First Amendment events at the Ordinance Committee, um, what we're trying to do is clarify the process. The, there is no permit required for a First Amendment event. Um, what we're really trying to do is clarify because we get questions all the time from uh, potential First Amendment organizers regarding what, what's required of them. Um, we appreciate the advance notification to make sure that everybody's safe, but currently there's no um, procedural change. It's just more of a clarification on how the process moves forward. Uh, as part of that, that was the recommendation from the committee that we would actually go back out and do some additional outreach to make sure that we reached into the community with all these other community groups that have, have traditionally not provided events or nor in our database for us to reach out to like we did all of our former event organizers. Rich, how are you this evening? Roger here. Um, I'm curious as to the overall impact of the festivals. I was in a conversation or a meeting the other day where it was commented that State Street's going to be redesigned and not go back to vehicle traffic and parades that have been there historically can just move to Cabrillo Boulevard. That's kind of a big adjustment. I'm wondering what these changes in this in the permitting process will do to the festivals. Uh, Chair, Chair Clark and uh, Commissioner Perry, I, I think you're you're taking two different issues and mixing them. Um, you know, the special event guidelines and the ordinance amendments really govern uh, how the city processes events, not exactly where that event is or the or any details about specific events. I I would suggest that you you close that you hold that question. Uh, we have Rob Dayton from the Public Works Department, as you can see on your agenda, who will be talking about the future envisioning for State Street as part of this meeting, and that would be an opportunity to to pose that question. I would also add that you're not the only one and the people you were speaking with are not the only one. Clearly, as we look to changes in the city's downtown, people are asking what next. And so I can I can I can I can share with you that there's plenty more conversation to be had, that nothing to do with these guidelines or going to city council would change that. Uh, and I, I do understand everything you just said, but questions were two separate ones. One was just an observation. The other was a question specific to the changes in the special events uh, guide. Is there any major impacts to the festivals? Uh, was that was that question? Uh, Chair Clark and Commissioner Perry, I, you cut out there at the end. I didn't hear the complete part of your question. The question is, is there any major changes within this document to affect the existing festivals? Uh, Chair Clark and Commissioner Perry, the, the simple answer is there's no major changes here. The entire process is designed to actually improve the permitting process, support the events that are currently taking place, and hopefully encourage more events to come here and find the process to be a lot more streamlined and customer friendly. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Hanna. Um, do we have more questions? 
No, I would just make a comment that um, this is an incredible amount of work mm -hmm. and um, streamline. Um. Ah, there I am. Um, I'm sorry, I was muted. Uh, I just, this is an incredible amount of work and I appreciate streamlining this process for the groups that um, want to hold events in our city. And it, from the, my reading of it, it sounds like a lot of it um, will now be stored online and able for a group to come back and then not have to reinvent the wheel with an application every time. And I appreciate the part where they don't go from department to department to hear different things, but that they are able to do a lot of that online and have a contact person. So thank you very much. I think it, it looks great. I, I agree. And I, I think it's a great step towards uh, we're trying to infuse our city with vitality and bring people here and make it a thriving community again. And I think this making, making it easier for people to have events is, is definitely a step in the right direction. Mm -hmm. And I, I also acknowledge the, the large amount of work and I'm grateful. Thank you. Thank you. I, I hear someone playing the guitar. I don't know if anybody else does. Do you have a family member playing guitar in the background there? Um, and that brings us, thank you, Mr. Hanna for that, um, to our final uh, agenda item. Well, we'll be discussing um, what Commissioner Perry just had questions about, the future of downtown State Street. Chair Clark and Commissioners Rob Dayton, as I mentioned, uh, from the Public Works Department is here to guide you through this discussion. Welcome, Mr. Dayton. Thank you, Madam Chair, Director Zachary. Just thank you so much. So awesome to be with you all. Um, at your meeting. We have been doing this to many, many, uh, at many, many commissions so far. I think we're on, I think, the 10th. Uh, so I'll get right into it. My, uh, my co compadre, Jason Harris, is on uh, vacation, so I'm flying solo. He's had to go solo for me a couple of times. Oh, and by the way, uh, the woodpecker, did you, did you love the woodpeckers? That was my daughter, Kenner Dayton. So no, who really? Thought that <laughs> I wonder. Like, how many times I am I on with you, and then she's on the same night. So wow, um, proud, proud dad this evening. Kudos. Thanks for that. So uh, we'll go you to the next slide. Proud. We're talking about the visioning of future, the future of State Street, and before I get into the story of State Street, which is just so fun. Um, Let's talk a little bit about what's going on because we started with the stay-at-home order uh, from Gavin Newsom, our governor, and uh, we were all affected by this COVID uh, issue completely. And then, um, you know, we've been really trying to do to figure out what to do. And, and how many know that we've been struggling with the, the economic quality of downtown? Uh, we've had the Cosmot report. We've had all this discussion about what to do about that economic vitality. In fact, Jason Harris, the the um, the um, uh, the uh, economic development manager, was actually hired to do all that, and then he arrived on the day of the closure uh, of pretty much downtown. So we were scratching our heads on what to do, and we uh, the council released that emergency economic recovery ordinance, which gave us the authority to close the street. And who would have believed what would have happened after that? Now we have this vital place in this COVID time, trying to be safe. We've got outdoor dining on the street. That's in response to the the pandemic because they can't have their they're, they're eating inside. That was really good that we did that. And all the parklets kind of went in because then Gavin Newsom shut it down even further. You couldn't go in the restaurant at all, uh, space at all. So that was a real lifesaver for the economy and for a lot of businesses. During this discussion, what's happened is the council has been doing a couple things. They wanted to figure out State Street. We've been flexible and nimble. We've changed things so fast going through that story is is just um, pretty overwhelming at how the things we've had to do almost on a weekly basis to adjust for the things that are happening in the street. 
But then they've also want, they started the State Street Subcommittee <laughs> to talk about what's next. What happens? What happens after the emergency ordinance is lifted? We call it, so we're in a temporary mode. What? How do you move into the interim mode? And then, and then, um, what is the future of State Street? And so that's what we're here to talk to you tonight. But just to talk to you about these in, interim State Street enhancements. So if we go to the next slide, the council just authorized these, and we are installing them. Uh, these are, uh, you know, you you might recall we have intersection barricades. It's very constructiony. You've got these temporary palm trees. So this is to try to dress up the intersections to be less temporary. Um, we're, we're council believes we're in here for a longer haul. There's a lot of people who really are excited about this this closure of the a the. Uh, American Institute of Architects did a survey. 49% people want that much of State Street closed or more. Uh, that was a, almost 5,000 uh, Santa Barbarans, not tourists, just locals. So really interesting. Um, uh, how do we keep it not to look not, not temporary? So this is the attempt to look not temporary. We're channelizing the bikes to the middle. The bikes and the pads have been quite frankly a very big com uh, conflict on the street. Uh, and that needs very much, we've heard again and again, that needs to be worked out. And we totally get that. It's not ideal. Uh, so this is to try to channelize the bikes to the middle, keep the pedestrians on the, on the outside and reset. You might be able to see the lights that we have, uh, we're putting across the intersections. Those will put be put up all up and down State Street. There's another intersection at De La Guerra. This one's at Anapamu, so you can look at that. Um, that show that has more lighting. And so we're, we're at the breakneck speed trying to get this, uh, these pots are on, a, on on order and get them installed with flowers. And then there's also ballers. They look plastic, or they look iron, but they're plastic. Uh, so uh, that's how we're dealing with interim. But really, if we move on to the next slide, let's talk about the future. So this would be post interim. This is probably two to three years now. What we wanna do is vision what would be the future of State Street if, if it was completely redone. It's really good to talk about the history to understand uh, kind of the epoch seasons of State Street. So this is the earliest picture that I have. Um, there's an earlier picture in your mind uh, of a Chumash Trail that went from the, the beach, West Beach, uh, the Burton Mound, all the way up to the Mission. That ran the same, uh, same alignment as State Street. So if you picture that, before State Street, it was a, a trail the, and it went past the Daily Guerra House, which was arguably the center of town in the 1800s and, and prior to that. And then, and then when Captain Haley uh, outlined outlaid the streets in the in the fifth, 1850s, uh, State Street and was more formally born. It was one of the first streets to put in. When this is a picture of with wooden sidewalks, it's dirt, and um, you can see the Victorian buildings. It was a very Victorian era town. And then you have the mule drung uh, cart, which is on rails, single rail, single track rails. And then on the back of that cart is actually the first multimodal um, bike rack for a transit vehicle that we know of in the world. And the big, uh, the big, the big tire bikes, the big wheel bikes were very famous at that time. And actually that uh, group lobbied for paving of the streets before automobiles existed. So pretty, pretty good stuff. The next slide shows a different State Street, uh, redone again, very, very different. This is 1924. You see the Granada Tower. Um, it, this is at Anapamu and State Street, so looking north. And then you have the Victorian era still there. You can see it if you notice the street lights. The street lights are, are Victorian street lights, uh, still there from the, uh, the, the, this street was redone in a Victorian era. So it had uh, narrower sidewalks, um, the lanes for vehicles were two lanes for vehicles, and then it had two-way trolley traffic. You can see the trolley electric at this time, no mule, but no more bike rack on the back. And uh, that went up to the Mission and down State Street. And then, um, and then if you look at the next slide, uh, we are going to go past um, 1925, which is marked by the earthquake. So the earthquake was very significant in Santa Barbara's history. Uh, for Spanish Revival architecture, that much you know. But what you might not know is that before the earthquake hit, the vision was already started. 
So Bernie, uh, Bernie and Irene Hoffman came to Santa Barbara in 1919. Their daughter, they were friends of Pearl Chase who came from Massachusetts as well. And their daughter, uh, Margaret had uh, diabetes and she was treated and cured by Dr. Sampson launching the clinic, his first trial studies of, of insulin shots. And so uh, Irene and, and Bernie gave back to the city by re-envisioning the city. They bought the De La Guerra house. They built the El Paseo, which you're very familiar with behind the De La Guerra house. They built that as a demonstration project for, the, for how the city should go. And what I want you to hear is that the vision for Spanish Revival Ar Architect was well underway, but the earthquake was an accelerant. So that made it all, the vision happen really fast. You can see in this picture, you've got the Spanish Revival buildings on the sides. You've got the, this is at Coda and State Street. This is the Santa Barbara Hotel. And then notice the streetlights have changed. Now we have an, an iron, a more, uh, uh, more airing of the Spanish Revival feel. The uh, trolley call, cars are long gone. Uh, the, the, the lines are out and vehicles are driving four lanes and uh, diagonal parking on State Street. We actually had diagonal parking on State Street, pretty fun. Uh, so the next slide, we're just gonna go through a little bit more. This is the, the next slide is the 50s. This is down at Haley uh, and uh, Haley and State where the sidewalks were widened more generously when this area town was improved. Spanish Revival buildings there pretty much uh, as they are today, except uh, some one of them on the left side, not there. And then going to the next slide, you see um, the 1960s. This is 1964 at Christmas time. Uh, State Street has changed again. Uh, the vehicle pattern, so four, five lanes of traffic, four, uh, two in each direction with a turn lane, and then you have parking on both sides, parallel parking, uh, bustling sidewalks, pretty overwhelming um, in terms of the numbers of people downtown for that sidewalk. And then you have at the intersections, the Christmas tree. We used to do full scale Christmas trees at each intersection on State Street. Uh, so the next, if the next slide shows what I would propose to you as the next earthquake. Earthquake 2.0 is what I call it. Uh, not a seismic event, an economic event. And that was the creation of La Cumbre Plaza in 1967. The year that uh, La Cumbre Plaza opened, it grossed more retail sales than all of downtown. You can see that sea of parking, which downtown did not have in the growing uh, era of the automobile and its needs. Uh, downtown did not have uh, parking. And so now you could go park right next to the store. It was very logical. And if you go to the next slide, what was notorious about La Cumbre Plaza it was what it was not only one of the first malls in California, it was the first outdoor mall in California. So no cars on this street, right? And then it has it has a nice little park like feel and then retail spaces uh, door to door. So very easy to be on and to shop on and pleasant. Uh, so what did the down down businesses do? Well, if you go to the next slide, we're gonna look at a, a bird's eye picture from State Street from, sorry, from Granada Tower, that's the Wentworth building you can see. And uh, what they did is they decided to tear up the entire street to mimic the feel of La Cumbre Plaza. So if we go to the next slide, it just, it's remarkable to see this next slide because the political will to tear up an entire street is pretty amazing and doing it this fast. And the next slide shows where we actually ran into the railroad tracks and they, they finally um, were removed from the street and then the next slide shows that same picture from the Granada Tower with our new outdoor plaza, park-like feel, uh, quite a transformation. The next slide shows what the elements of that plaza um, looked like. And isn't it interesting and ironic that it's called this, it was called the State Street Plaza after La Cumbre Plaza, not the opposite of way around. Uh, you can see the lush landscape, of course, you see the texture, which was a kind of a Spanish revival fraction of, of stamped concrete, various colors. You could see some of the planters that um, had uh, Spanish revival hints with tiles and tried to get that feel. This was only from Ortega to Victoria. And then next slide shows the RDA, the redevelopment agency expanded that all the way to Cabrillo eventually. And uh, then the, the uh, RDA replaced the, the sidewalks with brick and so we had that new feel. So what we ended up with now in these changing seasons of State Street, but pre the pandemic, is 
uh, sidewalks against the building with some restaurants uh, seating, landscape uh, benches, and then bike lanes, two vehicle lanes, right turn lanes, and then and then there's our attractive uh, shuttle, electric shuttle that we all miss, particularly the older one. Uh, and so that's what we were left with. And then next slide, uh, this pandemic hits. And who would have thought, again, we would be seeing all these people in a pandemic come out to State Street. This is the 500 block. And so here's, here's where that story kind of ends or merges with right now. So the question, next slide, the question is, what is this, is this the, uh, uh, is this the ne next epoch season? Uh, is this the, what I would propose to you as earthquake 3.0? Uh, earthquake 3.0, where we are we going to reimagine the entire street? The, the the State Street Subcommittee of Council uh, saying yes. They've sent us to to you to help imagine that street. And again, I'll remind you that the pandemic is just an accelerant. All the visions for revitalizing downtown were already in place before the pandemic hit. It's just accelerating the conversation. And uh, I don't think that we would be even discussing what we'd be discussing it. I don't think we'd be in anywhere near uh, some kind of a semblance of agreement about closing State Street to vehicles. And even I, I've actually been criticized for keeping an open mind. Um, I don't think we would be there if we didn't have this pandemic. So to help you think about this, uh, we want to tour uh, America and and uh, the and some countries in Europe to to get a feel. We just want to give you images of streets as, and then we're going to come back at the end and say, okay, so what is your imagination for State Street? And we've got some questions for you. So let's go to Pearl Street. This is in Boulder, Colorado. The next slide, and uh, uh, Pearl Street has a lot of art. You can see that it's got flowers. Uh, next slide shows that is it's a lot of art. So you got these bronzes. Uh, and in the middle of the middle of Pearl Street uh, Promenade, you have the landscape and the art. So if you go to the next slide, and you have play, so you have you have lots of kids space. This is not the only kids playground in three blocks, but if you go to the next slide, there's another one on another block uh, with kids playing on boulders, no less, in Boulder, Colorado. And then if you go to the next slide at the at one of the heads of the uh, the plaza, you have actually a splash pad that's uh, perfectly designed for kid play does add, add some passive activity for adults to watch the kids and the fountain. Um, next slide we will show you the, the impromptu entertainment that happens uh, around the kiosk. It's very a, a good, a very famous place where, where that's going to happen and crowds gathered and watch that. And then the next slide shows the more formal or staged um, music that might go on 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 this uh, street. Now, one thing I call attention to is someone who manages State Street now and the and the landscape. Uh, look at the you this amazing uh, tulips, uh, very well. It just looks very well maintained. How many know that that's going to be a lot of money to keep something like that going? So, it's something to think about in terms of how these other places go. And then this this uh, this little small orchestra is also. Uh, staged by the organization that manages the street. Next slide shows that this Pearl Street is actually uh, convertible. So it can convert on the weekends and, and offer more opportunities for other businesses to come in, much like an art show. And then next slide, we'll go over to Denver. Uh, Denver has a transit mall. It was a transit mall. They con converted it to a pedestrian mall. They kept the transit vehicle. If you see the tire tracks across the intersection on the, on the lower left, and then it has Pedestrians can meander almost anywhere on this. The landscape is in the middle. And then you see where there's an opportunity for a restaurant space to come out into the pedestrian space. Um, this is a this is a this is about um, uh, 70 feet. State Street is just for your your references. State Street is 80 foot right away. So our State Street is even a little wider. Next slide uh, shows uh, Charlottesville, Virginia. This is a very old pedestrian street. And you can begin to look at some of the textures. It's got bricks so that you can see some drainage in there. It's kind of interesting, the drainage uh, to um, kind of right in the middle of the screen, maybe a little to the right of the middle. Landscape in the middle, you can see the mature trees. The next slide shows the same setting at Christmas time. So you can see how the light, lighting changes. You've got some um, 
uh, iron, you got movable, movable uh, uh, seating. Uh, you've got uh, the like. See how the the lighting is more pedestrian oriented right now. The lighting on State Street is is it more vehicle or decorative oriented? This is more pedestrian oriented, uh, and you can see how um, vendors might come out onto the street. And then uh, the next slide, we're going to go to California. This is down in Santa Monica. You might have been here. This is the Third Street Promenade. Uh, actually, the Third Street Promenade first closed in, in 1975, uh, and actually was not uh, not a not a big win. Uh, it uh, rapidly deteriorated, and then they actually redid it uh, to bring the to, to bring the automobiles back. So if you look on the uh, both sides, the art and the fountains, those are actually vehicle lanes. And uh, it was so wildly successful after they redid it, they had to close the vehicle lanes again. Next slide shows another angle of that. You can see the lighting in the evening. This is where the vehicle lanes were in the middle. So it has that vehicle lane design that's not used anymore. So one notable thing, people are walking kind of everywhere. Uh, movable furniture here. And then uh, you've got landscape on either side of the road element or in the middle where the road splits. And then some outdoor dining. They actually have kiosks for uh, restaurants and floral shops in the middle that are of an iron nature. We don't have a picture of that. Next slide shows how that uh, actually Third Street Promenade has been struggling recently, and they've been trying to bring elements that would attract more people. This is the movable blocks for kids. You see the Jenga, you see the balloons for art, trying to jazz it up a, a bit to bring people back to uh, the pedestrian mall on Third Street Mall. Okay, so let's go away from America. Let's next slide. We're going to go to Barcelona. This is called the Rumbla. This is from the city center to the oceans, rather long, very formal, sycamore trees. It's a very wide uh, space on the middle and then on the sides, it's got the vehicle lanes. Um, this is a convertible space. Notice that the, 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 the furniture is, is very movable here. And then if you go to the next slide, you see how they convert the space uh, to have businesses flow out on it, onto it. So that, that, that it pulses uh, rather nicely and then they can do events on there. So everything that's on it is sem semi-temporary movable. The next uh, slide, we're going to go to South France. This is Avignon. Avignon, this uh, three blocks here is very much like the 500 block with pedestrians in the middle, uh, restaurants. You see where the restaurants are. And then there's sidewalks and landscape between the restaurant space and the building. Uh, more of a formal landscape. The next slide is going to be Nîmes, which is a sister city to Avignon, just, just down the way. This is a very formal space. Again, this is uh, sycamore trees. This has a, the same elevation slope as State Street and a waterway running down it. This connects the uh, city center to the train station. Uh, it also has road on the left side beyond the trees. Uh, the next slide mm -hmm. I think is in Scotland. I think it's Rose, yes. Much smaller than State Street. This is much smaller, but you can use the no bikes allowed on here. Uh, you have the restaurant space and a small pedestrian area. Uh, you're begin to begin to see with these other streets in European, you'll start to notice the, the residential above the street. And they the residential is extremely vital or important to the vitality of these streets. Uh, next slide is Copenhagen, Stroget. Um, really long, a mile and a quarter, which is really long for a pedestrian street. No, a very little uh, landscape. Uh, what is is potted. This is the kind of the, the one of the anchors to it with the fountain. Uh, you might notice the granite, uh, the granite uh, tile work that's there that gives a pattern. Bikes are allowed on the street with the pedestrians at random, not on a path. And then it has also the pedicabs uh, that uh, you can get a ride on a pedicab and go up the street if you do not want to walk. And next slide, we're going to go to Amsterdam. We're going to show you three images of different streets in Amsterdam. Very bicycle centric. They have a bicycle. You can see the texture of the path is buried for the bicycle so the pedestrians know where it is. So you have on the far right off the picture is a, is a street. Then you have the landscape, bicycle parking, then the bike path, then pedestrians, and then the, the, the building front or um, also restaurant space. The next slide shows a narrower street than State Street, but it shows where their all modes are allowed, kind of like a Warnerf. Um, invented in Germany. So you have Play Street, then you have bikes and pedestrians, and then if a vehicle comes, they're, they're going to be traveling a lot slower. 
not as much uh, opportunity for restaurant space, but there is uh, not a lot of opportunity for landscape. The next slide shows another multi-purpose street where you have one lane of vehicles. This is also Amsterdam, one, one lane of one-way vehicles, two-way bikes on the, the right, to the right of the bikes, uh, bikes and, and vehicles that are parked together in the middle. And then you have landscape throughout, pedestrians on the sides and a restaurant dining against the buildings. I noticed all the living space above. So that is our uh, impressions, our walk down State Street and the, the, the way it's changed through the epoch seasons that we've gone through. And then some hints of giving you some semblance of experience and what it might look like. If you go to the next slide, we have three questions for you. We have three questions to that we're, what we're using as a way to help formulate a vision. The State Street Subcommittee of Council has decided to formulate a vision first uh, before any design is started. What is the community vision? So in addition to uh, all the commissions and stakeholders we're visiting to ask these three questions, we are also doing a citywide survey that will try to attempt the same thing, a little different format because it's a, a survey. And then what we're going to do is take the, the themes, the, the themes that are repeated again and again and again in these work uh, sessions, these focus groups, if you will, and we're gonna give the themes to the, to the State Street Subcommittee, and then they're going to craft a vision statement and recommend that to the city council. So you have a very important role in trying to uh, give us this vision for the future. So the first question, what do you believe is the reason for redesigning State Street downtown at this time? Is, is now the right time to do that? If it is the right time in your mind, what is the reason for that? Uh, is it the shift of the epoch season and do we just need a, a whole wholesale thing? What is that reason for uh, doing the redesign of State Street? And then if the redesign is completely done, totally done, the redesign's done 10 years later, this is, the, this is a really important question. If it's done and you visit, you personally, individually are visiting the street, what are you experiencing in your ideal street that's done? What is that experience like? So you really have to get your head out of, you know, now on the state street, you know, because now you, everyone's got an opinion about how it is now. Well, now it's not redesigned. When it's totally redesigned, what, what are you experiencing and what does it feel like? Or what do you see when you visit? And then the final question we want you to each answer is, what is the what role does the redesign of State Street play in the vitality of downtown? So we've been talking, had this conversation about how do we make downtown, how do we revitalize downtown? What role do you think a redesign of State Street would play in that revitalization? So, uh, so those are the questions. Uh, Madam Chair, we just we just ask that you would maybe just have each commissioner go through them. That's how we've been going them. So I just have your name. I'm going to take copious notes. I will have your name, and I'm going to be typing out your answers and reviewing the tape to make sure we've captured uh, everything you have to say and answering these questions so that we can develop themes for the subcommittee. Okay. Um, okay, I'm going to suggest that we go one by one and make a comment, and I'll start and I'll be somewhat brief. Um, the first question, the reason for redesigning State Street at this time is twofold. I mean, State Street is obsolete as it is. Consumer preferences has changed. Nobody wants to go shop downtown when they can go to Amazon or go somewhere where parking is easier. And the second reason obviously is COVID. We can't do things that we've normally done inside, so we have to move them outside. And State Street is the perfect venue to do that with outdoor dining. So there's two reasons. It's one, State Street was obsolete as it was and uh, full of empty storefronts and decrepit, and two is COVID. Um, if State Street is redesigned downtown, I really liked all the pictures I saw of Europe. I've been a traveler. I've recently been to Scotland and England, and there's many places I've been where people are eating outside. There's parks in the streets, um, like what you showed of Boulder. Um, that would be my perfect experience. I would make State Street a destination. Um, and by kind of combining dining with shopping and play areas and also making it pedestrian friendly, that's it's a destination. People are going to go there to hang out. Um, and what role does it play in the vitality of downtown? I mean, I think it's it's integral. Our, our downtown is vital now, uh, post-COVID, but it wasn't before. 
So um, the current situation we have is is just making it glaringly obvious that having State Street be a destination and a community oriented place um, is gonna be the only way that we're gonna make downtown stay vital. Um, I think we really need to preserve the pedestrian environment that we have now and integrate a way to um, safely incorporate bicycles because I think right now that's a huge problem we have. Um, I, and I, I don't know which, which, I saw so many ideas about how to integrate bicycles in your presentation. I don't know, I'm not a, a, a street planner, which is best, but I think that's gonna be a really important consideration to make the downtown experience viable. Um, I'm going to, um, I'm gonna go left to right on my screen um, and ask Vice Chair McGill if she has any, um, if she would like to speak to those three questions. Okay, um, well, I think with the, the first one, the reason for redesigning State Street downtown, period, full stop, is that something needs to change. Um, State Street has been a place where for many people I know, and myself included, it's, it's not even a case of you don't think of going there, it's active avoidance of going there. And I've had friends tell tourists, you can go all these places, but stay off State Street. And that, that needs to change. Um, why now? Because now it's an opportunity to build on some success, to build on some excitement. So it's, it's a real opportunity and it would be a shame to lose that opportunity. And more further to that, I, I really truly hope that whatever happens doesn't get caught up in bureaucracy. It take two or three years to go through some kind of crazy permitting process. I mean, this is an opportunity to seize. Um, what is going on when you visit, what you're experiencing? Uh, I've lived in Europe many years. I've lived in Scotland. I've visited almost all of those places that you've shown. And what is going there is sort of the vitality of the human experience, um, a multitude of things to do, um, places to live. If you look at, and it, this gets to the bicycles a little bit, if you look at the one on Pearl Street, not only does it look inviting and exciting, it looks safe. It's a place you want to bring your family. It's a place you want to be all hours of the day and night. And I think that's really important when bicycles are addressed. Bicycles work in Copenhagen and Amsterdam because bicyclists know the rules and are polite and everybody understand each other's space. Um, I haven't seen that on State Street. So that that is something that needs to be addressed very carefully. But, but Pearl Street is exciting, many models, but anything that, that gives a variety of things to do and places for people to meet and feels safe and warm and inviting. Um, what role does redesign State Street play in the vitality of downtown? I would say it's more than downtown, it's all of Santa Barbara. It becomes a destination, it becomes a place of pride. Um, and to and it it would attract business. It attracts tourists, um, and I, I think that's that's more than downtown. That's the entire area, and that's me. Thank you. Thank you. Very well said, um, Commissioner Lexner Buxton. Yes, um, I think it's important to redesign. Street Street could have COVID and could, um, it's a ghost town down there. And I think that what would bring me into it is I'm someone who has a fixed income and options for like working class people like myself. I got it to speak to friends about street street and they go, oh, it's too much money to go there. So I think a lot of outside spaces with music and bands and rock will be great. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Commissioner Lester-Bucks. And I agree, I would love to see music and bands out there too, like we saw in some of the, 
photos of other um, cities. Uh, Commissioner Baker. So the first one, uh, I mean, the main reason for redesigning, I think this was, um, you know, there's been discussions about it before COVID, but I think, you know, the earthquake 3.0, as you said, Mr. Dayton, you know, this is the catalyst. Um, I think State Street definitely has much room for improvement. And I think the temporary changes we have, have shown us that, you know, there is vitality there and it can be regrown and um, a space for people to hang out. Um, when I first came to Santa Barbara as a kid, you know, it was you go to State Street and you you walk to the beach and you do that. And, you know, having been here through college and now, you know, after that, that's the space that I want my family to go to. And, you know, frankly, I haven't been to State Street since March. Um, that's because my wife was pregnant. We weren't going out. But um, even since then, I think, you know, we're getting more, you know, oh, look how cool State Street is. We've heard such great things. And I think, you know, redesigning it's going to make it even more of a destination to, you know, for visitors and friends and family. So I think the biggest reason is just accessibility, um, getting people back on the streets, walking, you know, we're a very energetic town. And that kind of goes to the last question you have, the vitality of downtown. I mean, that's the thing, vitality. You know, we want it energetic and, you know, growth and a place where people can um, visit. I think of the Grove a lot when I saw a lot of your pictures, like the Grove was designed to be that kind of Disneyland, you know, experience and not, not that, you know, it has to be this Disneyland, like magical place, but all those European, you know, influences, I think, you know, I got excited thinking, look how like magnificent this could be. Um, I think it would be huge for businesses. I mean, State Street has a lot of vacancies and I think, you know, as more people visit, there's more need for more shops and that increases real estate revenue. And I think it's just a great economic boost. So I'm excited to take my son there, you know, down the road and have him play in, you know, whatever water parks they have down there in the future. So thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Baker. Um, Commissioner Perry. Uh, Mr. Dayton, you got to hear me yesterday, but I just want to reiterate those two key points. Something has to be done to modify the buildings. Retail does not fit into six, 8,000 square feet. They need to somehow be reduced and hopefully replaced with some form of housing. Provide housing, you're going to revitalize State Street. Uh, the other issue is we've got to do something called the vacancy downtown. Um, Commissioner McGill said something about not sending people downtown anymore. I constantly hear complaints about the smell of urine as people go and come and go through the parking garages. Um, Commissioner Baker, I actually do think it should look like Disneyland. I think State Street should emulate Main Street USA. It, it, is, it is our most wonderful place in Southern California. And coming to Santa Barbara, our tourists treated that way. Other, the three questions I think I covered for you yesterday. Thank you. Is it interesting, uh, before I move next will be Commissioner Martinez Cohen, but I just wanted to speak to something you said, um, Commissioner Perry, is that I know with a lot of our park projects, when we renovate the parks and repurpose them for active use and people start going there, that in itself is a deterrent to vagrancy issues and the smell of urine in the street. So my thoughts are that if State Street becomes a little more Disneyland-like and people flock there, then there'll be less vacancy issues. I, I agree. And one of the former uh, county uh, park directors pointed that out to me 15 years ago. You judge a park by how many women feel safe in there. And same situation on State Street. Yeah, agreed. Uh, Commissioner Martinez-Cohen? Um, yeah, so I'll just echo a couple of other people's comments. I mean, I think the reason for redesigning State Street is pretty obvious. It needs it. It's much needed. Like everybody said, it was obsolete. It was kind of dead. There was a lot of vacancy. Um, to Commissioner Perry's point about the size of the square footage of the retail space, um, none of that makes sense from an economic development standpoint. Uh, so I think obviously it was necessary. And like you said, the, the catalyst for that or the accelerator is the COVID. 
Um, we finally had an excuse. I'm impressed that the city council moved so swiftly. I know there was a bunch of hiccups, you know, trying to implement rules after the fact. I know some folks, um, the bars and restaurants were not too happy about some of that kind of thing. Uh, but at the same time, I get it. I mean, we had to do something and I just think, you know, it's better than nothing. And I commend everybody for, for being adaptive and, and flexible on that. Um, so I think the reason is obvious. Um, you know, I do love all those European um, pictures that you've shown. I've been to many of those places myself. Um, I would go more to that European feel than the Disneyland type of thing. Um, I also really liked those Colorado mountainy kind of picturesque um, um, examples you showed as well. Um, you know, I have a little four-year-old daughter. I think having those adaptive play spaces for kids is so key. I mean, it's so hard to keep your child entertained and and do something that's fun for you. Um, there's so many restrictions, I feel like, at times. And especially when places um, don't feel safe, you don't want to take your kid, you know, out to eat or even just to walk around. I mean, kids just need to be outside and run around. So um, I think it's like all these experiential places where you shop and have an experience, that's obviously a really big um, retail trend these days. I think that's obviously the way we're trying to go. And I think that makes a lot of sense. Um, I do think, you know, as far as like the vitality of downtown, I mean, if State Street is downtown, um, I think a lot of the stuff that's going on in the funk zone is super fun for people too. I think maybe taking, you know, some of the great lessons learned there and implementing that more onto State Street. Um, I'm also a big fan of the pedestrian and the bike lanes. And so I do um, want to see how that can be integrated maybe a little bit more. I do ride my bike pretty frequently and um, I have not ridden it on State Street because it's pretty impossible to do these days. So I'm interested to see with um, zoning and, you know, creative design, how, how that can be a little bit more adapted because I will say that the State Street thoroughfare is a major bike thoroughfare in the bike master plan. Um, and so I think that's an important element to put into the design. Um, I also would echo what some other folks said about the residential. I think mixed use above State Street um, is a really good idea. They've talked about that a lot, you know, converting Macy's into like apartments or, you know, we need housing, we need workforce housing, we need affordable housing. I think putting housing into this master plan is gonna be key. And I also think it should definitely be workforce and affordable housing um, more than market rate. We have plenty of market rate housing. I mean, we don't have plenty of housing, we have the small town. But I think what if we wanna support the businesses and the employees that work at those businesses, we have got to create more affordable housing. And I think somewhere like State Street is a great example of how to do that. Um, the European models all do that. And I think that that makes a ton of sense. And we should, um, you know, look at those examples and sort of take a page from that. Thank, Thank you. you. Mm -hmm. Great. Um, Commissioner Longstreet. Thank you. Um, well, I echo what everyone has said. Um, we need to bring State Street back to life and we need to make it safe. Um, it doesn't always feel that way right now. Um, what I would want to be experiencing there is food, shopping and entertainment. Um, it's, it's always interesting to me that I can find a shoe store in Solvang, but I can't in Santa Barbara. You know, it's, we live here. We want to be able to spend our money here. And if we have, but for some reason, we haven't been able to make that happen. And so having more people downtown is something that appeals to both tourists, but to those of us that live here also. Um, I really love the European model too. I mean, we all have been places where it's so nice to sit outside and eat. Maybe right now, um, some of it feels a little frenetic downtown. It, I think we're all basing life off the 500 block. That's not the block we want to model after. That, that isn't, that's what comes to mind for me immediately, but that's not it. It's more what's going on up the street where you maybe have two restaurants out or three mm -hmm. in the block. And then you have other things happening that draw people up there to that spot. Um, 
again, back to the, the third question, um, you know, it, State Street is our tax base in many ways. It's where it all happens for us or should happen. I mean, it should happen out at Lacumbra also. We don't want to forget that, but it needs to be clean and family or, I mean, I want to go beyond family and say all age oriented. You know, I'm here surrounded where I work by probably, what, 200 units of senior housing that's two blocks off State Street. What is it for those residents to go to? And would they feel safe doing it? So we've, we've got to make sure that we're appealing to everybody because um, that's what's going to really keep it being vital. I also want to make sure it aligns with the De La Guerra Plaza redesign. It has to all be one, one project. It needs to work together. And how long ago was it that we did the State Street um, guidelines when we went through, I was on the commission, so it must have been 100 years ago, when we did all of the, um, the plantings and we looked at the whole, the street furniture. I think we need to revisit that plan, see what worked and what didn't work. Um, it, it touched me when he said, look at the beautiful flowers. That's in a place where it snows and you're not maintaining your, um, your stuff for six months a year, you know, so you can really put a big bang in for, you know, the six months you have. So for us, it's going to be drought tolerant and a different kind of planting. But I think we've analyzed a lot of that. And I think we have a lot of information, you know, already available to us. So those are um, the things I think about. And the main thing is to create something that we can keep clean enough that we all want to go down. I walk on State Street usually one weekend morning and it's, it's pretty bad. We really, um, granted I am walking through the 500 block, but it, it's not a place you'd want um, a visitor to get up and go in the morning to have coffee. It'd be just a little bit scary. So um, I just want us to be able to keep what we do um, alive and going. What's the scary aspect of the 500 block in the morning for you? Um, the number of places that have to have chicken wire up to keep um, homeless from sleeping there, the number of homeless that are sleeping there, the smell of urine, the food that's left on the street, um, Personally, I am not attracted to go down and eat on State Street now because those streets have never been cleaned before all those parklets went up. It doesn't look good to me. And it doesn't appetize, look appetizing to me. It Got is it. not like your European plaza with uh, tables and chairs that are pulled in every day. And, you know, it's just, that's my thing, but those are the considerations I would have to, um, to making it a, an inviting place. I love the idea of the playgrounds because again, that attracts elderly people who maybe want to just go down and watch life happen mm -hmm. and see children and do things like that. So that's my thoughts. Thank you. I'd like to see if we can get them done too, huh? Yeah. Yeah, that's the first the, the first I've heard out of everyone say, "Hey, we just a smaller process. Do we have to? Do we have to just have to drag on forever?" Yeah, and you know, I also just we talked at this when we did the um, transportation and circulation element. This is this idea has been around for twenty years that I've been involved with people, but we couldn't do it because. And now we may have to do it to be yes. alive here, to keep our city alive. Thank you. Does that help you out a little bit? Oh, it's amazing. Yeah, it's, it's really, really good. One of the things I'll just uh, I'll let you know that's kind of interesting as we observe all this is a lot of Santa Barbans uh, say, if you build it for the locals, the tourists will come. And you you kind of like you kind of understand that as a Santa Barbara, and, and and no one said this overtly, but what I hear between the lines is if we 
and not as much in this conversation. Some people mentioned housing, but we've had this um, pl uh, uh, planning has done all these things now to try to bring housing downtown and to have developers build that. And the new phrase that I've, I see probably emerging from this is build it for the downtown residents and the locals will come. Because what we haven't had in the past is we haven't had a, uh, what we're trying to create now with all this housing is a downtown community. So uh, I hear a lot of people saying, you know, make it a place where people want to just be. Uh, and that environment, people have said the live that State Street is going to be the new living room for all the housing, the living, you know, where you actually want to hang out. Um, so it's it's just an interesting thought that um, we're moving from build it for locals and the tourists come to build it for the community downtown and the and the locals will come. Just an interesting concept. Interesting concept. I am. I actually um, was talking to an older gentleman this week at work, and he was he was a little conservative. He was railing against the bicyclists taking over the town, but but he was telling me that State Street used to be five lanes, and um, then where did all the lanes go? He just didn't know, and I I wasn't believing him. <laughs> but in the presentation, it really did have five lanes. I thought he had a little bit of dementia, but I realized. <laughs> so thank you for that history lesson. I had no idea. You're so welcome. And it's such a pleasure to be uh, with this commission and uh, your comments will be forwarded by name. And uh, so they'll have the, the kitchen sink, everything, but the kitchen sink, as it were, all the, all the background and all your notes. And, uh, and then they will reduce these into uh, themes. Thank okay. you, Director Stackery as well. So, so could you perhaps tell the commission a little bit about the timeline going into end yeah. of the year 2021, so they have a sense of when they might hear back as to where where the process is going. Yeah, it's um, what has been on this call is the talk about being nimble and and responsive, and that's the most challenging thing is we're at breakneck speed on this process. We are not going slow. We and so. Don't, don't be afraid when I when I say we're making it up week to week, but we literally are thinking about what is the next step we have to think about because it's moving so fast. Uh, you can imagine that a capital project of the, you know, you, you, you live through the Cabrillo Pavilion design project. So, you know, you know uh, what, you know, you take such an important space as that, and how long it takes to just refurbish it. Uh, State Street is probably even a higher level of, of a lift. So we are projecting, uh, we have we put out there two to three years uh, for a design completion to maybe do some construction. That is, that is really, really fast uh, to get to a point where you'd actually be constructing something. But that is what we're, we believe we're headed. We've been saying that now uh, for about two months and the, the, the uh, members of the council have they're just kind of nodding. Okay, so we're moving from temporary to interim, which is this till the design is completed and go to construction. Having said that, think of all the things we need to do. We need to have a funding plan because we don't have the money for it yet. We need to figure out the policy. Some of you, um, and I think uh, Commissioner Perry also mentioned this several several times, maybe uh, Commissioner McGill as well, is the, the spaces don't, on State Street don't work. They're too long. So we need a, we need a land use adjustment. We're gonna need a policy, um, discussion about how is the street actually run and how is it kept? A lot of people have been saying safe. Um, so if we just improve everything, but don't manage the street better, that, um, and I think Mr. Perry also has, has uh, Commissioner Perry has mentioned this in two conversations that, that it won't work. The Disneyland's experience is highly managed. Um, and then we're gonna need art. People are talking about art already. We're gonna need a, some sort of an art discussion. So all that to say that it is gonna be, uh, you're gonna see First, you're going to see, hopefully by February, the, you're going to see a council, um, a vision delivered to city council for the street. That is our first order. Get a vision. Why are we doing this? What is the, the in very few words, what is the compass for the design? And then, uh, and then, and then we've got to figure out what is the design process. And if we're going to answer some of the people who have the opinion about making it faster, which thank you very much for that, we're going to have to consolidate design review 
you know, get, get people in uh, from HLC planning commissioner and council um, parks and rec commission to be together uh, much like we did uh, as uh, commissioner Longstreet was referring to, to the day of the GARE process. Um, so probably going to be, I think three years is the, is still fast. You're going to be seeing that process evolve. You're going to see a vision hopefully in February, and then we can talk about what the next steps will be after the council has that discussion for vision. And, and we've got more fleshed out. What I've just talked to you about is what does that look like to design, to redesign State Street? That's fast. Yeah. That's fast. Okay. Okay, so if there's nothing more, thank you very much. Appreciate you having my, my favorite daughter on. <laughs> oh, she was wonderful. Can you thank her again for coming to us? I will. Thank you so much. That was really enjoyable. Night. All right. Night. All right. Um, Rose, would you mind putting down the slide so I can see people before I say goodbye? No. Okay. With that, I will adjourn this meeting. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Bye, everyone.